Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. I am getting ready to go into module five, and then we have our exam. So let's get going. I'll go ahead and share the screen with you. Here we go. Okay, so here we are in module five, and uh, we're down, we're going, to, going to start with the um, organizational creation slide deck. But before that, just to make mention that the reading for this week is the Creator's Code Chapter 4, Failing Wisely. And there's a brief um, slide deck handout on uh, pop sockets, which is kind of interesting too and applies towards this chapter. We have the ONET resources under organizational creation. And I place this here uh, because if you don't want to start your own business and perhaps you are more interested in having a career, this is a great place where you can go online to get all sorts of great information about different career choices. So I would highly encourage you to go and explore this site a little bit, find out all sorts of information there. After that, we're going to go into market dynamics, and then I will show you the resources that apply to market dynamics, kind of some fun things in there. And then I'll give you a very brief review for the review uh, regarding the review sheet. And then we have our exam uh, that is due on Thursday. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our slide deck for organizational creation here. Oh, and it's not working properly. Okay, so let me do this instead. Let's see what we'll do differently. One moment. Okay, so this should be working. And um, so now let's go ahead and start from the beginning here. All right, so here we go. So we have different types of organizations. I'm just going to put it in this over here so you can actually see me while I am hopefully working here. Sorry about that. But at least you can get an idea of what's going on here with me. All right. So uh, there are different types of organizations, right? So we have commercial businesses, which are most organizations, and they, they typically tend to be privately funded. And there are some large companies that are also privately funded, mostly small businesses. So one question that was asked of me is, well, of the small businesses, what is considered a small business? Most small businesses have less than 500 employees. There are a few exceptions, but the majority, vast majority of businesses have up to 500, 500 employees. That's quite a lot, but they're still considered small business. Uh, let me go on here. So non-commercial, well, they'd be things like foundations and clubs and associations and, and such. Uh, they are uh, not for profit, typically. Um, schools, uh, illegal informal groups are also, like when I say illegal, we spoke about the mafia uh, last week, and that's an illegal group that is usually privately funded. Um, okay. And then we have publicly funded. So publicly funded. Now, when I say schools privately funded, private schools, not like FGCU, which is a public school. So a little different. So, but publicly funded are large companies that are on the stock exchange, right? So if you want to go public, then that would be publicly funded. Nonprofits, churches, museums are also fall into the category non-commercial that is that are publicly funded, usually funded by donors and uh, members. And then also we have perhaps military and schools that are publicly funded by tax dollars or other federal taxes or local taxes. Okay, this is uh, kind of interesting here. We have the oldest business organization is Congo Gumi, and this was established in 578, a long time ago, long before our time. It was uh, purchased in 2016, very recently, after 1400 years as an independent company. That's a very interesting. 
So you can see some uh, lots of other companies too that are very, very old. All right, um, now almost all organizations start small and stay small, common. A lot of small businesses, perhaps a restaurant or sole proprietors, just one person operation that, that just start small and tend to stay small. Small organizations are really significant in uh, job creation and having employees. Often have a good deal of social impact because there are so many of them. Large organizations are ec economically dominant, but it's the small organizations that really run the country. Another interesting point is that as it relates to organizations is that most US citizens belong to at least one voluntary organization. So organizations are not necessarily always a business entity as far as a for-profit entity. They can be many different types of organizations as we mentioned before. Okay, so now most businesses are small, as I mentioned. As a matter of fact, in 2013, when this data was collected, 99.93% .93 of the 29 million businesses in the US are small organizations, less than 500 employees. And most 80% of those have no employees except for the sole proprietor, solopreneurs as referred. Only 5 million with employees uh, uh, only 5 million with employees of these are almost 90%, fewer than 20 people employed. So you can see how small business really runs the country. It's a graph that explains a, a year span. So small firms are big employers, right? We, we understand that. Uh, it is almost 50% of the nation's private sector workforce. We have small businesses that is, have 41% of the nation's total private payroll. Significant. Create more new net new jobs than, than much business, than other businesses. So we look at a large business, we think to ourselves, well, big businesses have so many employees. One business is 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, but they're, are so few small business compared with small businesses. And that's why the small businesses really capture this amount of, uh, of employees and job creation and payroll. <laughs> there are uh, leaders at offering training and advancement opportunities as well. 67% of the workforce work for a small firm as their first job. And that seems to make sense, doesn't it? Because there are so many more opportunities that when someone is, comes from out, from out of high school or just graduates college, that oftentimes they will work for a small firm rather than going right into a large firm. And then incidentally, 46% of the nation's GDP is derived from small businesses. So, you know, some organizations do grow very fast, but most start small, stay small, right, as I mentioned. But some grow really fast. I can think of several, right, like Uber, for one, um, started, started small and grew very, very fast. And there are many other large companies now that have grown very, very quickly. Right? Amazon, for one, started off a little slow, but then took off, right, but there are many others. Um, they are generally more technical. So maybe apps, that sort of thing, more technical work involved in them that grow very fast today. And they, um, they start with a small market and scale up very, very quickly. Uh, they often attract venture capitalist funds. They get outside monies and large amounts of outside money. Yes, indeed, large firms are economically dominant. You know, 18,000 companies account for 60% of annual nationwide revenues. So yes, they are dominant in, in as far as revenues are coming into uh, businesses because you can, I mean, just look at, you know, Amazon, 
Facebook, Googles of the world, they uh, account for a large chunk of the economic wealth within our country. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the top 9% of large companies hold over 97% of all corporate assets. That is quite significant. And also the beauty of uh, our, uh, our system here, our economic system in the United States that allows us to uh, have the opportunity to grow. Uh, all right, so now the structure of firms, our, the legal structure, and on a note here, I just like to mention, if you do want to start your own business, please seek out legal assistance from an attorney. Uh, most attorneys will assist you with a 30 minute or one hour uh, consultation. And you can you know, have a list of questions ready to go that you can reach out to them and ask them these, this information at no cost. They have this free consultation service because they know you will uh, be working with them again as you're growing your business. So you want to get certain things set up correctly with your business and have the legal requirements all addressed. So, and organ so the legally you wanna be set up as a legal entity, but organizationally you wanna be structured to be able to grow. Some legal issues, right? So when you, you wanna select a name for your company and we can go into uh, different areas and we can branch off into different sections here. When you start a small business, you may start off as a sole proprietor, a one person uh, business, and, and perhaps you are uh, creating an app and you don't really need anyone else. You may outsource some business to an accountant or a bookkeeper, and you may outsource some other information, but you are the key person and you working as the only person and not have employees. Uh, but you want to select a name. So is the sole proprietor good enough? Or you might be, be you know, you may want to have some protect your uh, liability uh, a little bit with a uh, LLC, a limited liability company, or even a corporation. Again, again, that depends on your exit strategy. So if you want to start a small business and see how it goes, you may want to start out small, maybe as a sole proprietor, and you go ahead and get a business trade name, go to SunBiz, collect that name. Let's say I want to start a landscaping business, and it's just me, and I'm going around on my with my weed whacker and my lawnmower, and I don't need any employees. It's just me, so I'm just going to get a trade name certificate. It's going to be uh, Dr. Rose's Landscaping, and or it could be just my name if I wanted it to be but I get that trade name and I hasn't been used so I can use it. And then I can go into business right away. Simple, easy way to start a business. But I do wanna speak with an attorney because I wanna make sure that everything, is, that I'm doing everything correctly. So have that meeting with my attorney and uh, then I choose my form of ownership, right? Well, I'm gonna be a sole proprietor, but let's just say that I decide <clears throat> maybe I want to start a little bigger, or I have a partner, and the two of us are going to work on this business together. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what I decide is, no, I'm going to go with an LLC. Plus, after meeting with my attorney, my attorney suggested that I do protect myself, uh, the li liability against liability, so that if someone, if I do, do some damage to someone's property while I'm taking care of their lawn, uh, if they sue me, and I'm starting to build assets because my company is growing, that those assets will be protected. And also, because I'm the sole proprietor, they could come after me personally. So with an LLC, there's, there's protection of liability there to a certain degree. You have to be careful. Uh, one of the issues that can occur, even with an LLC, is that you need to follow the protocol of an LLC and act like an LLC. You need to have at least an annual meeting with yourself. If you're the only uh, member of the LLC, you still need to have a meeting and document that meeting. If you, and there are a few other restrictions. Speak with your attorney to find out what's required. But if you take care of those things, then no one can pierce the LLC veil and uh, sue you personally. So you don't want that to occur. 
The same can happen with corporations. You can have a corporation, if you don't have your annual meetings and you don't follow the rules of a corporation, someone can pierce your corporate veil and sue you personally. And that is not what you want to occur. So you wanna make sure that you have everything taken care of legally. The other thing I suggest is you wanna reach out and have an attorney early on and then an accountant and an insurance agent. So to make sure you have everything covered. Now let's go back to my scenario with me starting the landscaping company. So I said, no, I'm just gonna start small. It's just me, I don't, I don't need any other employees. And uh, I am just going to be a sole proprietor. But what I'm going to do to protect my liability is I will get insurance to protect. But what happened is over time, I've grown the business and now I'm thinking, I meet with my attorney again, perhaps I should get an LLC at this point. I'm still going to stay local. I'm not planning on going, traveling too far. I'm staying in the local area for my business. So I want to uh, get the LLC and then I won't, uh, and have the insurance and I don't need to really grow and have a corporation. But if I had a different type of company, let's just say still a landscaping firm, but I want to grow my company nationwide. I want a large, expansive uh, uh, landscaping like conglomerate, this gigantic thing that takes over everyone. It has a certain standardization of landscaping, very clean trucks, very clean. Everything's done nice. Everyone's in uniforms. It's really beautiful. And I want to go nationwide. Then I may want to start as a corporation. Yes, I'll be taxed twice as a corporation, uh, but I will have a sale of a product because my end goal is to sell the company. So I want to be able to have it prepared and done correctly, set up legally as a C Corp so that I can either go public or sell the company to a larger uh, outfit. Okay, so anyway, back to legal issues here now. So we choose, it's the form of ownership, and then we want to uh, obtain an FEIN or EIN number. And this is a, it's sort of like the social security number for the organization, but it's a number that you can put out there and give to suppliers and so forth. You don't necessarily wanna be giving out your social security number to a lot of different sources. So even with a sole proprietor, having the EIN number is a good idea so that you're not using your social security number. I mentioned you could obtain a fictitious uh, business name permit that you go to Sunbiz, get a fictitious name. This is for a sole proprietor. The LLC would come up with a name also. You would search the database within the state of Florida to see if the name is being used, if it's available, and you can do that all in Sunbiz. If it's available, then you can use it, but you're limited to the state of Florida. That doesn't mean that you can't sell anywhere worldwide, you can, but you can't have another corporate headquarters in another location outside of Florida. It is specifically for the state of Florida. It can be good, it can be bad, it depends. If you want to go public and you want to expand the business beyond Florida, and that means the headquarters, you want another headquarters maybe in the Northeast, another one out in California, uh, then you want to be a corporation. So you need to discuss that with your attorney to see what is the best fit for you. There are trade-offs for each, right? You may need some kind of federal license or permit. So you want to look into that to see what's needed. And, um, uh, you know, maybe obtain local licenses as well. You may require that. With my landscaping firm, I um, need uh, to have a, a local license with my community. Uh, but I don't really need any type of certification. So, so I'm good with that. Okay. So we want to sign off and get that all taken care of. The three board cat broad categories, as I mentioned before, sole proprietor, uh, which has unlimited liability. The LLC, oftentimes partnerships. You know, we have two or more people becoming members of the LLC. And uh, it limits the liability in most cases, as long as you follow the rules. The C Corp, 
is also has a limited liability, but you do have that double taxation problem. So you're taxed on the corporate level and you're also taxed on the individual level of the monies that you withdraw from the company. Here's a nice little chart. You can reflect on this a little bit here uh, regarding different types of legal structure. And here again, percentages of, and you can see that the sole proprietorship is the most popular indeed. Issues to consider, you know, it, um, <clears throat> you know the control and management and the resources associated, uh, perhaps access of information and speed of uh, making a decision, right? So if you have a partnership, you want to take a good close look at all these items and, and decide who's going to do what and really put that in writing it would make a lot of sense. The accountability, reporting relationships and so forth. So challenges of a structureless environment. So we have issues with structure, right? Uh, but what are the issues if you don't have structure? A, a whole slew of problems. Many more problems occur in a structureless environment than in a structured environment, right? So duplication of effort, you know, uh, perhaps the goals uh, to move the uh, corporation or the or the business, I should say, business forward, uh, uh, don't don't uh, coincide. Uh, inconsistent quality, maybe chaotic communications. So there's lots of issues that go along with that. So, you know, there are common routine performance measures that you need to take into consideration. And that usually should tie in with the organization's mission. Stuff like the production, if you're manufacturing, administration, sales, marketing, accounting, and so forth. Here's an example of an organizational chart, affectionately called an org chart. Uh, here, this is a top-down type of organization where you have the president, CEO at the top, and then you have vice presidents and your managers, and then you have the employees. Uh, what's become much more popular today is a flat level organization where everyone works on the same level and managers are really support systems. Instead of telling the employees what to do, this is what you must do here, they are there in a servant leadership capacity and helping the employees by serving them. Instead of this is what you should do, their comments are, what can I do to help you to do your job? Okay, so far different and much more welcoming. So yes, not all organizations are good. We'll certainly know that the illegal organizations and the mafia and so forth are not good, but there are legal organizations that are not good as well. Theranos, uh, I believe you've probably heard about the story of Theranos and uh, the deception and fraud that was involved. Uh, Bernie Madoff is another one. Uh, deception, fraud involved. Uh, a lot of money stolen from very smart people and smart investors fell prone to both of these organizations. Enron had their share of uh, misdoings, let's say. There was, uh, there was some issues going there. There were mark to market uh, and probably shouldn't have been done that way, but it's not all ad blown out fraud like Theranos and Madoff. So there's also the, the alternative organizations, as I mentioned, you know, the um, cartels and the uh, others. Here's a nice little engagement chart. And I think this is really nice for you to maybe hold on to for when you do have employees and you'd want to think about how you can drive engagement within your organization because people love to work and have job satisfaction. And here's some good section. I'm not gonna read this all to you, but please take a look at it and see how it might help you with your business. Leadership, again, I had mentioned um, good leadership is important. Being a servant leader is much more uh, welcomed than having a manager tell you what to do. It's much more welcoming to have someone, what can I do to help you to do your job better? 
Uh, so here's information on voluntary organizations. There's many, many more, but you get the feel for it. Challenges of no structure. Okay. There are opportunities. We've touched on this slightly. You have duplication of effort. You have unassigned tasks. So the accountability is askew or not even mentioned. And then who knows who does what? A uh, few goals to motivate the process, right? And inconsistent quality for certain chaotic communications, as we mentioned before. Uh, alternative organizations, they lack the organization structure. They're uh, illegal for one. And oh, that's the end. Okay, so we've managed that. And let's go ahead and take a look at the next section. Oh, I have to change my screen here. Go ahead. So I'm going to go change it here to screen two. And so what we have now is we have market dynamics uh, resources. So I want to go ahead and take a look at that. And the resources start off with a Steve Blank video. Uh, want your startup to succeed? Yeah, good question. Of course we do. But he has a good message that he points out about finding out what the customer wants first. And a lot of what he speaks about is uh, very much in keeping with our all-in startup textbook. So remember this as you're reading the textbook because it does pertain. There's a really nice video here uh, from Google. Now Google here, they are presenting their own advertisement and done in such a wonderful way to convey emotion. We're gonna go into that emotion slide deck in just a moment. Here's another uh, video on creating emotion fuel by photographs. So oftentimes we need to advertise with a still photograph image and sometimes video. So how can we convey good emotion? And then here's a very nice brief video from Phil Knight, how he started Nike. And I think you'll enjoy that as well. All right, so let's go to the next slide deck here. And the next slide deck is market dynamics. All right, so let's move on. So here with market dynamics, move this out of the way so you can see better here. Think of, you know, we all want our business to go viral, right? And when we think of this, we can think of this as pretty much like a pandemic. It starts with one person, spreads out, and then just keeps on going, right? So that's how we can think of how we want our message to be conveyed to others so that they will, in fact, uh, purchase our product or service. So here, very much like a pandemic infectious agent, and then it just keeps coming down when it gets to a pandemic, when it is um, in the viral stage, uh, similar to our business. So here it is similar, the market adoption section, right? We have the company, we have our current users, just a few, we've got all these referrals, and now we have market penetration. We really have things moving along and we're hoping to go viral at this point, right? Here, most companies that are just growing organically here are following a, they're growing, but they're not growing in leaps and bounds, right? They're growing fairly well, fairly linear. And here, this is a non-linear line of how can we get our business to grow virtually? Well, some of the suggestions might be, well, what we could do is uh, uh, if we have an e-commerce business, we may want to reach out to our targeted audience. We wanna find out, well, where do our, where does our target audience, what, how do they reach social media? If it is a, um, it could be Facebook, it could be Instagram, depending on your target audience. And not only that, maybe advertising on there or posting on there or both, but you also may want to use influencers and then you pay them a certain percentage of what they, they sell, but you have so many more people 
that they're exposed to as a result of having that influencer. So that's something to consider to make your product or service grow that much faster. So message versus messenger, right? So two key things to keep in mind. Uh, so here, the, the, you know, the message represents the arrow moving along. I think you can pretty much figure that out. And then the messenger represents this, this, the circles, right? The circles are the messengers. So here, um, a message spreads many, many different ways, right? We're interested in the brand. How do we promote that brand? Well, here are some suggestions. Uh, and what is effective in driving people to have a specific desire to want your business? Let's consider that. <laughs> okay, so here we have different types of messengers. Uh, ha have you read the book, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point? Excellent, excellent book. He speaks of these types of messengers, the connectors, mavens, and salespeople. And uh, I think you will find the book very interesting. I think he's probably one of the better authors on the market today. He represents the connectors as extroverts, people who just like to be around other people and network a lot, right? And have people that hang around people with common interests. Mavens are basically the master researchers. They're always looking for information, nuggets of information. And the salespeople are the master persuaders. What category do we want? We really want all the messengers you know, to help us with our business. Again, Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point, excellent book. All of Malcolm Gladwell's books are, are really superior. What about word of mouth? Well, word of mouth advertisement is important too. You know, every hour there are more than 1 million conversations about brands, eh, pretty cool. Uh, and some other interesting stats here you might find relative or important, relevant, excuse me. Uh, the science of social transmission. Let's talk about this. And again, we're touching on some more theory here. Uh, social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories all are part of the science of social transmission, how we transmit a message. So, and they're all key and important. So let's start with social currency. People like to share messages that give them a positive image. So here I wanna, I wanna convey a message that perhaps makes me look stronger, faster, smarter, wealthier, whatever the case may be. Uh, like, oh, you know, take a look at this car because of this reason and that reason. So people like to uh, provide a message that po puts them in a positive light. Okay, so here is an interesting social currency here uh, idea. It is, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the blend, uh, uh, blend X, I think it is. I'm not sure of the name of the blender, but the, uh, the very interesting advertisement piece that they had done here was a series of will it blend. So they put many different things inside the blender, one item at a time, Seems like they were doing it almost weekly. And they would try something new and then finally they went with an iPhone. And the result of this extreme marketing, often called guerrilla marketing, is that it had a huge spike in sales. So sometimes extreme advertising and the, the remarks making this remarkable uh, is also part of social currency. How can this work, right? Breaking the patterns, making it risky, a risky situation. Okay, so let's go on. Gamification is another one, right? So under social currency, having some type of a reward program in place is a good way to have a, um, a game, you know, some people feel like, oh, I can go from one level to another or to another. Uh, and it provides a feeling of being in the insider right? and uh, or a scarcity, uh, an exclusivity uh, because you're part of this group. So that's something to consider as well. Triggers are another one. So 
as uh, incidentally with between Cheerios and Disney World, you would think Disney World gets spoken about quite a bit. Uh, Cheerios gives uh, receives more word of mouth than Disney World. Uh, the other thing as far as triggers, we can in visual uh, imagery or video, we can convey certain well sites, obviously, but what about smells? Sound, yes, if we have audio associated with it, but smells, sometimes the way a video is depicted, it can bring back a memory of a smell or it can just uh, provide us with an image of what the uh, aroma might be. Often triggers are uh, related to certain times of the year or month, whatever it may be, that triggers certain things, holidays, that sort of thing. And there are other triggers that are associated with something else, like here in this it's Kit Kat commercial next to a cup of coffee, uh, because oftentimes uh, one brand uh, tries to, certainly not any brand of coffee, it's just coffee in general. Now going on to emotion. So research has found that high arousal is the most effective. And it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative emotion, just that it is high arousal. Um, so as far as negative, it'd be anger, anxiety, you know, positive, all excitement, amusement. You know, those are the areas that people like. Public is another one. So people are sharing messages that really are designed to be viewed by the public, right? So we're looking at, uh, imagination is the key component of human behavior, right? Think about, imagine you're visiting a new area, you, you're on vacation or something, and then you want to go visit a restaurant. Do you go into a full busy restaurant or do you go into one that has very few people or is empty? Most people would want to, well, I'm going to go where others are because that is probably a good restaurant. Some may say, well, you know what, I'm here uh, during the day, I want to get some work done. I'd rather stay in a restaurant that doesn't have a lot of people so I can get my work done. Depends on the situation. But here we have social proving and urgency, right? So here we have urgency triggers. Two left, four left here on this. Oh, this flight has only four left. There's an urgency to select the big red button that call to action right away. So it's a call to action with an urgency trigger. And so many people will go ahead and, and purchase it, right? You better hurry to get yours now, right? And it's, it's an extra push. Uh, so here are some other social proving uh, ideas here as well. I voted, right? So just to show that, yes, I'm a responsible person. I did vote. I got a sticker that says that. Uh, this is an Uber logo it's on the car, identifies that as, a, um, as the Uber vehicle. Um, Live Strong, uh, Neil Armstrong's uh, kind of badge there, right? So you wear it along so you're agreeing with him. Practical values, I'm not suggesting you, you wear it to agree with him. I'm just making the statement that that's what someone would do. <laughs> Okay, so practical value, people share messages that, that really help people somehow. They're providing some sort of value. And isn't that what we're doing as entrepreneurs? Entrepreneur is the process of creating value. Here is one interesting practical value video. You may wanna take a look at it. I'm not going to play it for you. Uh, it is a gentleman who found a way to shuck corn very quickly and easily. So there's not one strand of silk left on the corn. Sometimes when you're shucking corn, you've got the, the silk just wants to cling on to the corn and it's hard to get off. Uh, but what he does is he microwaves the corn, I believe it was two minutes, and then cuts off the end and then the, the sleeve just slides right off and all the sink accompanies the sleeve and there's nothing left on the corn. <laughs> Interesting. And it tastes good uh, microwaved in the husk. So people like to share messages that help other people somehow. And this was, look at the amount of views, right? That many views for shucking corn, <laughs> almost um, three quarters of a million. 
Then we have stories. So people really can get wrapped around a story. Oftentimes now, people like to share uh, the story of how they started their business, who they are. Years ago, we didn't want to talk about who we were as the owner of a company, as the entrepreneur. We kept that behind the scenes. We always wanted to seem like we were a large company when we were starting off as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a small business. But today, things are very different. Now, due to social media, people really want to know, who are you? And what, what is it that drives the business? What is the why behind the business? What does the business stand for? What, what is the brand? How does it relate to your, uh, your why, uh, why you're in business? So I'll give you an example. It's my son and daughter-in-law, I mentioned them in the past, they own a company called Dino Bars, and they are a uh, healthy alternative snack for a young child, one year old and older. And there's not much on the market that's that quality type of item. And it's also uh, wrapped in, in a edible paper that so they don't have sticky fingers, so they could take it with them wherever they wanna go. And they don't make a mess with it. It's all digestible and it's called edible paper, but it's really not paper, it's all food. But anyway, uh, their why is not to sell these dino bars. It, it is to help young children to eat properly. That is their mission, that is their why. And that's what they brand. And so companies like that, that have a why reason why they're in business, what they do, then they make a product or service to accompany it. And that's what they're doing. It's the same uh, with Apple, right? So, and, and, and when you see uh, Simon Sinek's why, you will see how that all fits in very nicely. But I wanted to explain it here because it, it's part of the, it's telling the story, it's part of the branding, it's part of the image. Stories do tell a really interesting story as well. Not story, it's all a story. Um, Airbnb has a really good selection of their community of the, uh, the folks that rent out rooms or whole houses, but some of them rent out rooms in a, a part of their home and they, they provide information about that person. Perhaps they're an artist they're a sculptor, they do different things. Uh, they're into nutrition, they're into different things. And it's interesting to get to understand whose uh, place you're going to be staying with. So there are many different ways to tell a story and make it a good way to advertise. Okay, so now we're finished with that. So let me go ahead and move over back over to the screen one. Okay, so now here we are module five. Uh, we have the review sheet that is due on the 25th, which is tomorrow. So please go ahead and complete that and turn that in. The exam is due on Thursday. I'm gonna go ahead and just post it now so that you can take it at any time. As long as you finish the review sheet, you do wanna have that review sheet at hand when you're taking that exam. It, it's a very useful tool. If you start to go looking in the book or you're going to run out of time, you have 40 minutes, there are 40 questions. You'll definitely have it done in plenty of time, but you, don't, you want to have that review sheet ready for you. Let's talk about a few things on that review sheet that you want to be sure you put emphasis with. You want to be sure that, you've read, you, that you have read all the chapters in the textbook up to this point. You want to be sure that you've thoroughly gone over the social progress and the social index. So cover that. Be sure you fully understand institutions, that they are not organizations, they are not industries, they are institutions, very different. Please make sure you understand institutions very well. So uh, also under, you understand market systems and economies. Uh, so 
please take a good close look at those as well, organizations from today. And also be sure that you uh, view the videos that are in this section and be sure to look at the Zipcar video. Um, the only other thing I wanna mention is just be sure that you do know that in the past, in the, during the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, we were really uh, a um, manufacturing or uh, we were a manufacturing country uh, for that matter, our economy actually. So we were manufacturing. Then we moved into retail and service, right? So uh, retail business and service industries is what we moved into, right? And then now where are we going? we're moving into technology. We've already begun and have been in the technology space for quite some time. So consider that and um, you don't need to do any outside internet searching for any of the items on the review sheet, please. All you need to look at is the lectures uh, that I've provided for you, the slide decks and the uh, resources. Uh, and the textbook. So that's what you need to focus on for that. And now you will do very well, I'm sure. If you have any questions, please message me so I can assist you. And best wishes on that test, on that uh, exam. And then I will go ahead and uh, move on to module six.